Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the JCRSJ Symposium titled Revoking Irrevocable Punishment. We're lucky to have the next couple segments in person. Here to discuss with us their personal experiences with the injustices of capital punishment are Joseph Giertano, Sabrina Butler Smith, and Gary Bridger. Gary Bridger spent close to six years on Alabama's death row for a crime he did not commit. After his exoneration in 2001, he attended college and worked as a laborer and as a peer specialist for the witness to innocence, where he supported fellow exonerated death row survivors as they navigate life after exoneration. Gary contributes his gentle yet powerful voice as a speaker in the movement to abolish the death penalty. Traveling throughout the US and overseas to share his story of wrongful conviction and incarceration on death row. Sabrina Butler Smith was a loving teenage mother when she was wrongfully convicted in the death of her nine month old son in Mississippi. She was later exonerated of all wrongdoing. After spending six and a half years incarcerated, two of those years on death row, Sabrina was the first woman exonerated from death row in the United States. She now works to change legislation, determined to make the system better so others, especially you, do not have to experience what she did. And with us in person, we have Mr. Joe Giratano. Mr. Giratano spent 13 years on death row. He received a conditional pardon in 1991 from the former governor, Douglas Wilder, due to serious doubts about the crime for which he was convicted. And he spent a total of 39 years in prison. Upon his release, Mr. Giratano joined forces with the UVA Innocence Project. After completing his time with the Innocence Project, he signed on with a small law firm where he worked as a paralegal handling criminal defense matters. Mr. Giratano currently works for Premier Jury Consulting Services, LLC, out of Richmond, Virginia, owned and operated by Senator Joseph D. Morrissey. Mr. Giratano has attracted significant attention due to the innovative legal scholarship he has brought to his involvement in the right to counsel and other death penalty litigation, criminal justice reform, and to the articles he has published on criminal justice issues. Today, we have Professor Pepper who's moderating our panel. He's a graduate of Washington and Lee University, the University of Virginia School of Law, and Emory University. Professor Peppers holds the Fowler Chair in Public Affairs at Roanoke College, and for the past decade has been a visiting professor of law at the Washington and Lee University School of Law. Professor Peppers is an author, co-author, editor, and or co-editor of six books and over 25 articles on the federal courts and the death penalty. His newest book will be published later this year by the University of Virginia Press and examines the life and work of former Virginia death row chaplain, Russ Ford. And with that final word, I'll let Professor Tucker speak to you. All I want to uh, exercise a point of personal privileges for a moment. In the spring of 2016, a crowd much like the one here today took part in a symposium, which this way, symposium sponsored by the Washington Lee Walters. The symposium used Joe Garacano's case to explore ongoing problems with the death penalty. Joe was not here. Joe was in prison. Even though Joe had received a conditional, I had received a pardon from the governor of Virginia based on concerns of actual innocence and had a sentence reduced from death to life. And even though that pardon urged the Virginia Attorney General Mary Sue Terry to give a Joe a new trial, um, Ms. Terry, who was getting ready to run for governor of Virginia herself, declined to give Joe a new trial. So in our symposium in 2016, Joe was in prison. One of the most remarkable experiences I've had was in December of 2017, where my son and I stood outside of prison in Virginia and watched Joe walk to freedom. And who had been in since 1979. Uh, it was an extraordinary moment. And it's not often in life we get to meet our heroes. Uh, this morning, you heard from one of my personal heroes, uh, Sister Helen Prejean. Well, Joe Garitano is also one of my heroes. Earlier today, we talked about mental handicap in the afternoon. A man named Earl Washington Jr., the IQ was 68 came within eight days of being executed in Virginia for a crime he did not commit. He was sitting in the death house listening to the testy electric chair 
And Joe Giratano here, sitting in his own cell, filed a, a, a petition, you want to call it a petition, that they put that way, that stopped Earl Washington's execution from occurring. Earl was unrepresented by counsel at that time. Virginia was getting ready to execute a man who had no attorney. And but for Joe Giratano, Earl Washington Jr. would be dead. So this is a remarkable man, and it's remarkable that Joe is here with us today. So I want to start off, I want to start with you, Sabrina, if you can hear me okay. I want to ask Sabrina, then Gary, then Joe a series of questions to start off with. Uh, as uh, Claire indicated earlier, Sabrina was on Mississippi's death row. She was convicted falsely. Um, the death of her uh, nine-month-old son, Walter, Sabrina, this symposium is about errors which occur during capital murder cases. Could you talk a little bit about your case and the errors, the mistakes that led you to death row? Yes. Um, first of all, in my case, I didn't have the right proper attorneys to start with because they did not call not one witness in my case. Um, the district attorney at the time, he tried to strike as many uh, African-American jury members from the pool so that he could get um, majority uh, white people on my uh, jury. Uh, I had one uh, African-American on my jury, on the entire jury pool. Um, I was, I only saw them two days before trial after sitting in the county jail for a year. So I had no preparations. I was 17 when it happened to me, went to trial when I was 18. Um, the district attorney took the jury to a picnic while they were supposed to be sequestered during uh, my trial, in the first trial, um, he talked to all the doctors and nurses in one room. So they pretty much knew, you know, what they were gonna do before they even saw me. So I knew even that young that I didn't, I, I was gonna lose. I, I just knew that, you know, just looking at what was going on. I said to myself, I mean, this is not for me. One of the um, attorneys in my trial was drunk. He was drunk during the whole thing. He was popping candy in his mouth and he kept, telling me, no, you can't take the stand. We got this thing nipped in the bud. He never let me take the stand in my own defense. So I, I just knew that my life was over. I just, that's the only thing I knew being 18 years old. Um, when this happened to me, they took me into interrogation at 17. I did not have my uh, parents or anyone present and they bullied me into signing a uh, confession. And that's the confession that was used to um, give me capital murder. They charged me with a child abuse law that wasn't even a law until 23 days after my incarceration. So when I um, ended up on death row, I was 19 years old. Um, and I sat on death row two years, nine months until I ended up with two sets of attorneys who came in and found out that my son had heart problems, kidney problems, chronic bowel syndrome. It was nothing that I had done to cause his death. Um, when they brought all of this to the, to the jury, they brought in the second trial, I was able to prove my innocence, um, after six and a half long years of fighting for showing them that I didn't do anything wrong. And, uh, today I have a, uh, 19 year old daughter that has the same disease my son died from. So, I mean, that's, that, those were all the things that he had 27, the district attorney had 27 violations in my case. And wasn't um, another issue, Sabrina, is that the medical examiner in the first case sort of signed off on the idea that your, your son had been abused, and that was that ultimately proved to be incorrect. The medical exam as well, is that right? That's right. He he changed the story on the on the uh, stand. <clears throat> yes. Gary, can we ask you the same question? What mistakes, errors, missteps led to you being on uh, Alabama's death row? <laughs> Well, basically, they had no leads in the robbery murder case in, in my case. And when my sister got stopped in a traffic incident and was busted with cocaine, uh, she told them that I robbed and killed a man. They conspired with several people to build a case around me. Uh, they sent her with a wire and... The lead investigator was supposedly listening in a van and he testified in the first trial that uh, he heard me say 
the old man grabbed me and I went with my gun. Basically, that's what got me convicted. But in, in, in their conspiracy to convict me, they, they gave her a quarter ounce of marijuana to sell to me because it was dry in the area that time. My wife and I smoked marijuana, and we got it from my half-sister. Uh, when they stopped me and arrested me for the capital murder, they scraped my side and bloodied my knees, throwing me on the ground because there was supposed to be an altercation in the man's kitchen. Then my ex, my wife at the time, they send a, a man to seduce her. He, he comes to where she's working and he, he starts talking to her a couple of days a week and, you know, gets to know her and basically seduces her. And eventually he steals letters from her car that I had written her while I was in jail. You know, just, just natural letters, you know, how are you doing? How are the kids? Uh, what's going on out there today? You know, it's something like that. Nothing to do with a crime whatsoever. Cause I didn't know nothing about it. Uh, the police wouldn't take the letters because he'd stolen them out of her car. So he eventually broke into her house where she was living and hid them under a bed so they could get a search warrant to come get them. Uh, one more thing that he that they conspired against the guy that they sent out there to seduce her he stuck a gun in her mouth trying to get her to give him some inspiration but she didn't know nothing because i hadn't done nothing again so i go to my first trial and the uh, my attorneys were basically like sabrina's they hadn't they had never handled a capital case they basically just uh, put forth the textbook motions and t told me, you know, not to worry about it. There was no evidence against me. And there wasn't because I hadn't done nothing. Again, uh, the tire tracks that they got from the scene of the crime didn't match mine. The fingerprints that they got didn't match mine. The, there was an eyewitness that he heard a popping sound and a car speeding off. That car... You know, they had pictures of that car because he had described it to them. It was a, a reddish like Thunderbird with a broken taillight lens. Okay, they had pictures of that car, but they never would tell us, you know, who, 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 whose car it was. They said we, we forgot or, or they, they basically made up excuses why they wouldn't tell us whose car it was. But it didn't match my car. And... I, I waited in county jail for two years. Uh, the attorneys came to see me maybe once, about a week before the trial. They wouldn't answer letters. They wouldn't answer phone calls. And the biggest thing, I think, in the conspiracy, while I was out, while, while before they arrested me for the capital murder, I was going to a doctor every month to get refills on, on some strong pain medication and strong muscle relaxers. And it pretty well kept me, kept my head foggy. It kept me laid on the couch. Well, when I, when they arrested me and put me in County jail, they let me go see that same doctor every month to get the same medication. They don't let you get narcotics in jail. I mean, this, this was something to keep my head foggy. So I wouldn't know what, you know, couldn't really think of, to help my attorneys or fire them or, or what, whatever. And eventually uh, they found me guilty and sent me to death row. If the leading, if the investment, the attorney and the, I'm, I'm sorry, if the state's attorney had not got greedy, I, Alabama would have killed me by now. During the testimony of my uh, first trial, they asked my sister. She, she had to testify that they had a bunch of stolen stuff in their trailer and uh, where they were getting it and whatnot. And if he had to ask, ask her if I wasn't a ringleader setting it up, then I probably wouldn't have won my appeal. That was one of the main issues on my appeal. It was prosecutorial misconduct. And if he hadn't got greedy and asked that question, Alabama would have probably killed me. 
Now, I, I read about your case, and one thing I think I read is that they offer your sister some sort of plea deal in exchange for testifying against you. They gave her immunity. They gave her and her boyfriend immunity. Which is and in a lot of during the second trial, we were basically able to prove that it was her and her boyfriend Robin killed a man. So, Joe, let me ask you the same question. Some of you all in your classes would talk about the competency of a wit of a defendant to stay on trial. During Joe's trial, he was so hopped up with Thorazine that I think he drooled all over council table. But can you talk a little bit about the errors and mistakes in the legal process that led you to that? Well, I think that the, put everything in context. I wound up in that way because basically the cops in the case failed to investigate. Part of the reason they didn't investigate was my own mental incompetence at the time. And You know, 1979, I was pretty much a drug addict, serious alcoholic. Uh, every drug you could think of, I, I, I had taken. Uh, suffered from blackout. Uh, worked on fishing boats, uh, scallop boats. Came in off the boats one day and found place where I was staying found two of my friends dead. I didn't know what to do. I got on the bus uh, to head back home where I felt safe with my mother at the time. Uh, walked up to a cop with a bus station and said, Hey, two of my friends are dead in Virginia. I don't know what happened. I don't know if I did it or not or whatever. And uh, was arrested. Was going through drug withdrawal. They immediately had me sent to the um, psychiatrist who pumped me up for the board room. The Texas and also came to Florida and wound up writing five different confessions. Each confession was inconsistent with each other, they were internally inconsistent and uh, inconsistent with the, the known facts of crime. The reason the confessions kept changing. The first confession they got, they built off of their visual inspection of crime. You know, they, they examined the crime scene, they thought they knew what happened, so they built the confession around that. They collect all the physical evidence, the physical evidence comes back. This was in 1979. We didn't know what the physical evidence was. Until like 1985. They had fingerprints, they had some shoe prints, they had sperm, they had head hair, and they had pubic hair. So, whoever committed the crime, that's their. Bodily evidence. Well, they tested it and it came back and none of it matched me. So instead of scrapping, ending their efforts to, to finalize their confessions, they went ahead to finalize the confessions and hit me up. I had a four pointed attorney who saw what kind of shape I was in. He pled me not guilty by reason of insanity. During the trial, which lasted probably four hours, including the lunch break, the judge stopped the trial because I was drooling out the side of my mouth um, and basically hanging over the defendant's table. And he stopped and he said, Find out what that man's getting the illegal drugs from high in the courtroom. The prosecutor stood up, my defense attorney stood up, and both said, No, Your Honor, he's under psychiatric care. They have the medication. The next thing I know, I woke up, I was on that road. Went through the appellate process. As, as Todd mentioned, Professor 
as Pepper mentioned earlier, I received a conditional pardon in 1991. Governor Wilder strongly urged and recommended that pardon that I received in the trial. Todd Cliff, Mary C. Perry, then Attorney General, uh, said there would be no new trial. But her reason is what shocked me. She said evidence of innocence is irrelevant under Virginia procedural law. At the time, she was legally correct. Every newspaper in the country and around the world said she was legally correct all the way along. Back then, Virginia had the 21 day rule. Joe, I don't want to help you again, but I think we just need to talk a little louder. Maybe if you feel comfortable, you can bring up your mask. Maybe that'll amplify your voice. That will help. There we go. <laughs> um, but she said, you know, we had the 21 day rule. Yeah. 21 days after your conviction, didn't matter what the evidence was, you can have a videotape showing you in the last of playing with the seal hmm. on the day that the murder happened. If it came up 21 days after your conviction, it was forever born. You could not present it. So that's how I wound up on that verdict. That's why I didn't get the new trial. But the case gets more complicated. I had a four and a half hour capital murder trial. Basically. My attorney didn't make a single objection to the trial. In fact, he had just left the prosecutor's office. I think that was his first murder case, and it's why it was a capital case. The prosecutor was a former boss. Oddly enough, I think six to eight months later, the prosecutor became a judge. My defense attorney went back and became the head prosecutor. And famous for saying that he, he got he had gotten five death sentences in his career, four for prosecution, and one for But because he made no objections to trial, we couldn't look through no issues with the race or appeal. After my direct appeal, the new attorneys got involved. Richard Barney was one of them, who was through the Lord Smith. And they came in and found a multitude of errors, including uh, my not being competent to stand trial. But all of those issues were procedural law. The court said because they weren't contemporaneous objections. Or an executive contract with this one. Same thing through the federal process, the state aid court, all the different courts. But we did get a hearing in the state court on ineffective assistance counsel. And one of the questions that my attorney was asked why didn't he object to anything? And he said, well, he didn't want to object to anything because he didn't want to hang his judge. And the judge ruled that that was a strategic decision, and therefore not ineffective. We continued to appeal and be appealed, and, and, and finally, I started getting an execution notice. I had five execution notices. Three of them were not so serious. I know I did this thing. The other two were serious. I wound up in the death house, wound up having a lag. It was a, a whole system of errors from start to finish. I'm here, I'm alive, I'm doing well. And, and people sometimes ask me, well, doesn't that prove the system works? And I'm like, no, it just shows us how broken the system is. Well, you know, well, the appeals process worked. Well, no, the appeals process didn't work in that case. It didn't work in a lot of people. In every case where the person has been exonerated, they had a trial. They went through the entire appellate process. Their convictions were upheld. Yet they were innocent. And that was the case in Earl Washington. Earl was seriously mentally challenged. He came to death row. He couldn't read or write. He had no attorney. After his direct appeal, Mary C. Perry sent him a letter in the mail advising him uh, he couldn't read the letter, he wanted to me. And I wrote, and basically, what he said 
you have um, two weeks to file your habeas corpus because if you don't file within two weeks, you'll get two uh, more for that. Even though they believe the letter, uh, that's all the people don't have. And you can see here the I have been working on a legal theory about the right to counsel and death penalty cases. I drafted a law, a lengthy memo about a year before when I sent it out all over the country. Various law professors and attorneys to see if I can get somebody else to take the case. Um, nobody responded uh, except for one, one attorney, Jack Bowser. Who was at the time the head of the NAACP was defense He said it's a great argument. He took it for 25 years before he signed. But then they moved early to the dead house. So I filed the case uh, in federal court. Judge issued a preliminary injunction. Uh, we got attorneys from New York to come in and help the case. And we actually won. So a two day trial. We won the state appealed it to the four circuit, um, four circuit of attorneys. We appealed it back to the full court because of who the dissenting judge was. We won the case back, we went up to the Supreme Court. And the court was split. Four justices said there was the right to counsel, four justices said there was what. Justice Kennedy wrote a separate opinion. Agreed that there was no right to counsel because nobody had been executed without counsel. Earl Washington got an attorney at that. But he also said that if Virginia executed somebody without counsel, he would change his vote and vote that there was a constitutional right. So, what that did was kept the federal court from saying that there's a right to counsel from the constitutional. But it also forced Virginia to have a clear statute about the council and capital cases. Ultimately, that's what it is. Let me jump in here for a second. Gary and Sabrina, Joe thinks that the fact that he is alive is not evidence that the system works. You both have new trials, and at your new trials, you were ultimately exonerated. Sabrina, do you think that your story is a story of the system working? Uh, no, I do not think it's a, a story of my system work of the system working. I think my my case worked in spite of the system because the second trial they came in and they wasn't they didn't ask for any money to do my case. They actually did my case on integrity, and that's what it's about. When you are faced with charges like this and nobody is seeming to do what is right, then we got a problem. You know what I'm saying? I just don't think that you should just because you have uh, a title that it gives you the right to just throw people away. I was a child that they did this to. They took my life from me, and by me being on death row for this time, six years, any time. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I, it was traumatic for me, and I feel like um, that it should be more done. And I just don't think this is right. You have to. It's a fight all the time. I've been out here and it's been hell. You know what I'm saying? And I, I just I just don't think that is right the way they, they have done us. And we pretty much have to prove our self-worth to fit back into society. And that's not right. I don't agree with, with the way the system is doing things. I just don't. So, no you, so, so Gary, on your second trial, you got representation from the Southern Center for Human Rights. You got a higher quality lawyer for your second case. Do you think the system worked for you, Gary? No, because if I hadn't been begging for, for help, uh, they would have gave me the same shoddy lawyers. I would have went right back to court and been found guilty again. Uh, if they'd give me the time back that I lost, it might work. <laughs> Gary, in some cases of false convictions, Defendants will turn around and sue the state for compensation. Did you right. receive any compensation from Alabama? No, I received none. 
there's several people been been tried to sue Alabama and they they've been unfortunate and hadn't hadn't got anything. Alabama's not going to give you anything. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry to say, but we're one of the b- most backwoods states in the <laughs> union. <laughs> I mean, our schools are last. We're, we're one of the most backwoods states in the union. <laughs> And they'll, they'll declare themselves bankrupt before they give a exoneration. Don't leave that. Thing. Don't leave that Mississippi here. <laughs> we, we just had one man get off. He was on there for he was on death row thirty years, and they ain't giving him nothing. How about you, Sabrina? Did you ever get any compensation from the state of Mississippi? Yeah, yeah they gave me what they thought it was worth. They said, "Okay, hey, we gonna let you go, so you ought to be satisfied." We're going to give you this. Now go on into the world and do you. That's what they said. And I said, oh, okay, that's how it works? Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they did. <laughs> so one of my students wanted me to ask this question, and you all have kind of touched on this before, but Carl and Gary and Sabrina just pushed the show. Today, you're out. Have you recovered from your time on death row? How has that experience affected you and how you live your life today? Before we start, Sabrina. All right. Well, to start with, it took me about 10 years to get where I'm at now, where I can talk to someone. Uh, yes, I have PTSD. I think all of us do. We have some form of it. Because can you imagine you knowing your death date and you're sitting there waiting to die? That is something that I can't even explain to anyone or they can feel my where I'm coming from. That was something done to me that I would never forget. And it is hard for me to, you know, to go through my everyday life without thinking about that. But one thing is for sure, it, do, it didn't silence me. And I'm gonna continue, I don't care what I gotta do to talk or whoever I have to talk to, to let them know that this is wrong. And no one, I, no matter what race, what color, whatever, should be treated like that. America should not, kill its own citizens, innocent at that. So no, I'm not gonna go stop talking. I'm, I'm gonna keep on talking till I can't say a word. My teeth fall out of my mouth, whatever going on, I'm still gonna be saying something. That's Amen. just the way I feel about it, cause it's wrong. It is deadly, it's deadly and it's wrong. How about you, Gary? Hey, I'm, I, I agree with Sabrina wholeheartedly. My teeth already fell out of my mouth, but I'm still <laughs> 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 Joe, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, in a lot of ways, I'm doing well since I've gotten out. Uh, but PTSD is a big issue, very big issue. In fact, PTSD is part of the reason I left my last job. I got to be too much working in a small criminal defense law firm. Yeah. I was having to spend a lot of time going back into prison to visit clients, in and out of jail almost weekly. And for a while I could deal with it. And <clears throat> you know, my rationale was you know, just keep immersing myself, just keep forcing myself, pushing myself into it. Yeah. It got to the point where I just couldn't do it. I just, I couldn't think straight. I was having nightmares, wasn't sleeping. Giving my wife a hard time. Uh, too much, and I, I, I quit. There was no notice. I quit. I told myself to do this anymore. Yep. Explain why. And whether he understood it or not is another question. But I think he got it. I've seen him in the past. So, uh, yeah, PTSD is bad. Um, doesn't take a lot to trigger. Yeah. Counseling doesn't help. Uh, it just doesn't work. So I deal with my demons. I talk to my wife. Spend a lot of time in meditation. I'm um, still doing some of the same work. I'm not having to go into jail or prison like I was before. But I've realized now that the line of work that I'm in 
I'm not going to do that with the board. I'm going to have to get away from it. Hopefully, I'll buy a farm sometime in the next year or so and live. Just chill. <laughs> and maybe do a little bit of you know, some of the stuff that I do for myself, the traditional farms, parts, and stuff like that. Not the day to day and out of the day. That is a direct effect of who we went through and the experiences that I've been through. If I could piggyback off of what you just said, I want to say that going through this type of trial and tribulation, you or us as human beings, we have to figure out where our place is. And we have to figure out what we're going to do to keep ourselves alive and keep ourselves going. Me, I chose to let go of what was happening to what happened to me, you know, and, and channel that energy to be positive because it was killing me to be mad at these people and they were going on with their lives. They didn't care what they did. You know what I'm saying? So what I do now is I live in bliss. I don't live my life apart, you know, being upset and all that kind of stuff. I recognize that only it's only one me and I have to do what I got to do to take care of me. So I have fun with my life the best that I can. I enjoy the air outside. I love animals. I'm a dog person. I don't know about the cats, but I'm a dog person. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love God. You know, I love my children. And I mean, that's what keeps me going. And that's what makes me feel safe. And to, to be able to do what I'm doing right now, tell my story as, as often as I can to many people that will listen. Um, it, it, it helps me know that the fight is not over and that we can change this thing as long as we stick together. And those people like me who want to fight and those people who haven't been on death row that want to fight, let's do this thing and squash the death penalty for one, because I don't think it's right. I think that money should go somewhere else, like infrastructure, roads, bridges, education, the things that we need, it should be happening, not wanting to know Where's the drugs, man? Let's go ahead and kill so-and-so before they expire. That don't make sense. I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, Arkansas. Uh, they were rushing to kill the people because before the drugs expired. Where do they do that at? I don't understand that. Make that make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. So I'm just saying, I mean, we need to do this thing, and we need to get rid of this because it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. For the last couple of years before Virginia abolished the death penalty, Commonwealth of Virginia got sued because of conditions of confinement. When Joe was on death row, inmates interacted with each other. There was a common Claudia. They ate meals together, played cards. They went out and exercised. In Virginia in 2015, there were 23 hour a day lockdowns. Yep. You're correct. But, but, no. This time, yes, we, we, we were able to do that. But that's because of the first lawsuit we filed. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have sued for uh, you know, dealing with you know, basically solitary confinement. Uh, I think we wound up suing four different times before we actually won. Uh, but no, we won each one of them, but they were changed the name. It's not solitary confinement, now it's segregation, uh, administrative housing, or something else. Or something else. I, I just recently testified about this for the Senate. Um, because we have the buildings and bottles out there from time to time. That's basically what death row was. We spent you know, 23, 24 hours a day in the cell. Yeah. Came out on a wreck yard in a dog cage by yourself one at a time. Uh, a lawsuit changed that. Uh, but it, it, you know, I had to tell the Senate Department of Corrections that they no longer use solitary confinement. I was born in Call of Wires because they're still using it. I talked to guys. One guy has been in solitary confinement for 20 years. He doesn't know speak English. They say he, he, he won't participate in a program, but all the material they give him in English. So he's still in solitary confinement. So we talk about PTSD, and if we could start with you, Gary, and Sabrina, the wise Joe. How did the conditions of 
confinement? What were they like in Alabama, Mississippi, and how did that impact you? Well, the I was in a little five by eight cell, concrete cell. We were unique in Alabama where we got to go out in groups of 30 and 40 to exercise. We had full contact visits. I mean, that wasn't so bad, but when when some of your friends went around there to be killed, uh, if the wind was blowing right, you could smell flesh burning. And, and about five minutes before they were to be executed, everybody would start beating and banging on the bars. I had nightmares probably for two years after I got out about them taking me around there to kill me. And they went away until just a few months ago. And my wife told me, my ex-wife told me that she had nightmares about the state fixing to kill me and make trying to find her and my children to make them come watch. And it brought it all back. And I, I mean, you do what you can, but wake up at night in a cold sweat thinking you're fixing to be killed. It ain't nice. Yeah. Ain't nothing nice. Sabrina, how about the conditions of confinement and how they impacted you in Mississippi? I was locked up 23 hours a day as well. Um, when they let us out for our yard call, uh, we stood in a bullpen with the sun beaming on the head. We didn't have no nowhere to sit, you know, just like a dog in a cage. But like Gary said, I, you know, I panicked because my death date was July the 2nd. I was sentenced March the 13th of 1990. My death date was July the 2nd of 1990. And nobody told me that the state had exhausted all state remedies before they could actually carry out the death sentence. So I was scared to death. At 19 years old, I didn't know what. I, I, I just, when I, when I tell that part, it, 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 it hurts and it bothers me because that is a cold thing to know that you're innocent and can't do anything. Nothing but wait on the mercy of these police officers and all these people that are coming to take you to die. That was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to face and experience in my life. Uh, in the cell, I got rats in my cell. I had ants on my tray. Um, when it was cold, I had to figure out how to stay warm. When it was hot, I had to figure out how to stay cool. It was horrible. And I, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I wouldn't. It, that was horrible. We, you know, nobody cared. They didn't have nowhere to put death row inmates at the time. So they put us down a hall and they put a piece of tape on the floor and said, no one beyond this point. I mean, and other other uh, security guards from other prisons would come down and stare at us like monkeys in a cage. I mean, <laughs> it, it's horrible. That, that was horrible. I mean, they, and then the only thing they could say to me was, why do you smile so much? Every time we come down here, you're always smiling. And my, my statement to them was, I smile because I didn't do anything wrong. Why, why would I not smile? I'm going to get out of here. That's what I told them. I'm going to get out and they said, well, everybody say that. I said, but I'm going to show you. So it, it takes a lot, you know, and it's a lot of strong will to try to, to deal with that type of incarceration. It takes a lot. And especially being charged with killing a child. If they had to put me in the population, I would not be sitting here talking to you right now. Because in county jail, I had to fight every day of my life to survive. So, I mean, I'm, I am not, no, I'm not happy with what happened to me. Not happy at all. And the conditions are horrible. One short story, Joe, I was hoping you would tell before we ask for questions. The old Virginia State Penitentiary was in downtown Richmond. And until 1991, the bowels of that crumbling edifice was the death house. And one time you were there, Joe, when you talked about what room was used when you met with the attorneys, you know, and, and tell them sort of what that was like. Well, I, when I landed on death row in 79, death row was still the old state penitentiary in downtown Richmond, in the basement. It was a row of 11 cells. We were selling up town. The chair was at the end of the hall, maybe 20, 20 steps away from it. 
they walk into the basement, came down the stairs, you walk through the metal door. The first door you see is a big oak door. That, that was the entry to the death house. Cell block was to the left. Once you got into the cell block and walked to the end of the hall, there was a room. And you go in that room, and that's another big oak door. And there's a table with a microscope and a couple of iron style chairs. That's what we met with our attorney. But it was also the cool room. And they brought you in the front door into the bed house, set you in the chair in front of you, took you out of the chair for the the pressure. They took you into the cool room. They put you on like, like a table, I put sandbags on you, stretch your body back out. Um, that's where my thought was coming. And he used to when he was back there after he ate at lunch. One of Joe's friends, a death penalty activist named Marie Dean, said one time she was in the cool offering meeting with a client, and she looked down at that Vermica table, and there's a piece of flesh on it. From. So that's the type of conditions of confinement. And if you were down there um, on some of the next few things, then you could smell the body flash. The myth was you could know, see the light flash and that, that didn't happen, but you could smell the burning flesh. So, Ms. Welch, how do we handle questions, either from the live audience or the virtual? I will let you know if something comes in virtually, but if anyone from the live audience has a question, now is a great time. I know some of you I can cold call. <laughs> <laughs> we have a hand over here. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I like your small interview. It seems like you've uh, been failed by the system in large at multiple points. Uh, and maybe this is a, a difficult question, and it might be different answers for each of you, but what uh, uh, cog in the system would you place the most blame upon? Whether it be ineffective assistance of counsel, uh, the appellate process, the law, up to you. Thank you. I don't think you can put any one of those in the forefront. Usually it's a combination. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but everything starts with the investigation. So in my particular case, a lot of it fell on the police department. But then I also had an attorney who was in the bed. Didn't do any pre-trial investigation. Didn't challenge the case in any way, shape, or form. But then when you get to the appellate process, depending on how well your attorney did down here, if the issues weren't raised, you kept your procedural default rules, the contemporary and subjection rules. And, and, and Virginia, Virginia is known as the worst state. To see what it was the argument made in every death penalty case. And in 99% of those cases, they won. The sad part of my case, I think the federal court compute the case, they said there were plenty of errors in it. But they went, but the uh, rules of procedural default barred them from rules. So we admit that there's errors that you can let the information stand. And the same thing happened you know, in every death penalty case I've worked on, and I've, and I've worked on hundreds of them at every stage, you know, from, from trial all the way to the appellate process in front of But it's usually a combination of errors that can occur at, at any stage in the case. But everything begins, you know. And that's the whole point, you know, about Virginia abolishing the death penalty. It's been a long battle, it's been a hard battle. Uh, you know, I've been involved in it from the beginning. Uh, and, you know, our system isn't perfect. You know, I love our system, I love our Constitution, and I write about it all the time. It's, you know, it's an amazing concept. That so in one sense, the problem is that the system, the people, you know, we're imperfect human beings. 
There's something that a lot of good enforcement from the outside. Prosecutors have to get elected a lot of times. <clears throat> you hear people running for office, they oppose the death penalty, you know, all their lives, and then they run for office, and you know, now they support the death penalty. Yeah, so you know, when I say the system is broken, I don't mean that in a broad sense. It's the, the errors that occur in these cases are human errors. And because of that, we can't exact irrevocable, irrevocable punishment. You can't do that. Those are mistakes you can't. Correct that in the first place. And we know we, we, we know for a fact we have executed people that are innocent. Some say we openly agree with that now. So, you know, it's. But also, in saying that, abolishing the death penalty doesn't fix the problem. You've got guys who put in women and put their natural life and never see the light of day. This state is abolished for it. We abolished for it in 1995. We just pushed the bill to bring it back, bring it back to that table to the next session. So, you know, people going into the system now will have to all. Life means life in Virginia. You know, I'm, I'm working on a case of a man who's been in prison for 49 years. He's 72 years old. He's climbing through the wheelchair, can't take a shower without an oxygen mask. He has cirrhosis, cirrhosis, hepatitis C, and a host of other ones. Doctors say he can be dead. He'd be lucky if he lived five years. But we're spending, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars about his case, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in medical costs. And, and, and I'll talk to keep him in prison. He won't be so threatened to society. But he has an natural life. You know, which is the other thing. What I don't know if there were errors in this case. I, I saw her in France at 40 years old, they're trying to find all But abolishing the death penalty doesn't fix it. We'll fix that. We'll fix the whole problem. But you can't. Living people to fix it. You're the next generation lawyer, the next generation politician. And I hope y'all carry that responsibility. Gary and Sabrina, the question from the audience was if there was one, what was the biggest error or mistake that went wrong in your cases? If you could point to one thing, what would that be? Um, me, I would say uh, at the beginning, the police officers, because that's where it comes from. Wherever they collect, whatever evidence they collect, I think the district attorney um, has to look at that evidence. Um, but it's still, like he said, it, it's, it's multiple things. Because once uh, the police officers bring it in, the district attorney has the right to say this is good or it's not. Um, and, you know, it just depends on what he wants to do. So, you know, I, I say all of, all of those things. Please, my attorneys, the district attorney, all of them, you know, they all of it failed me in my case. All of them. Gary, is there one particular smoking gun in your case? One particular error? Yeah, they lied. I mean, I mean, the lead investigator just lied on several things. Uh, had they been held accountable for their lies, then maybe it wouldn't be so much of it. But they lie, cheat, and steal. And if we if we can uh, hold them accountable to where they won't lie, it'll be a lot less of it. We have a question, Claire, from our virtual audience. One that I can see yet. How about one more question? Anyone have a question? We also need good prosecutors. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. Who were your New York lawyers and how did you end up getting New York lawyers? Uh, I got New York, New York lawyers uh, through Marie Dean. Uh, she ran what was called the Virginia Coalition on Sales and Prisons. 
uh, from 1983 to 1992. Uh, when I filed the right to counsel claims, uh, I contacted Jack Rogan and the NWA CPD defense claims. Once I filed the case pro se, I made myself a straw claim as I made earlier. Okay. Jack said, well, we got to do something else with Jack. He contacted his old firm, Brady Department, Paul White, recruited a couple of junior associates to come into the case. A lot of other stories to go along. I wanted to fire twice <laughs> in the courtroom. <laughs> thereafter. But that's how we got those things. Uh, back then, the didn't even appoint attorneys to any case except for trial. You had. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And still have those yeah. Most of the cases get flat out. Uh, a lot of you know, <coughs> defense attorneys don't get paid. Don't get, they need to be paid. It's sad. It's rare to find, but not so rare. There are attorneys who will step up to the plate. And, and some some of the lawyers that was just in my case paid out millions of dollars out of their own money, out of their own pocket. Same thing in Earl's case. One of the questions about like compensation. Uh, we did sue Virginia, the state of Virginia, in Earl's case. And we won. Judge Morgan decided to come out. Uh, Virginia changed its law after that. You can't sue the state for compensation. It won't make that decision. <laughs> they, they have a legislative process that you have to go through. That injunction is one of the issues. And one of them is you have to issue an absolute part. And it's funny because I was talking to a fellow judge who asked me the question. You can say that nobody ever had the full bargain. Uh, then you do. Because they owe you four years. I can pay you. Uh, and this is another. He was the same judge who wanted to go to the court or all office. So I'll make closing argument. I have a minute. So Gary and Sabrina and Joe. So three people, right? So three people, the system isn't perfect, but the numbers are much higher. Since um, we reinstated the death penalty in 1976, 186 people have walked off death row because of you know, concerns, evidence of actual innocence. That's an extraordinarily high error rate. And as Joe pointed out, death is different. You make a mistake, you can't resurrect something. So this, this isn't just three cases, this is a very high number of cases. Exactly higher in some respect. The U.S. Justice Department statistics state that one out of every hundred Individuals convicted and imprisoned is likely to be in. That's, that's their estimate. We have what? How many people off that? 200, two, two million people off there? Half a million. That's a lot of those people in prison. And they don't have the right to counsel unless somebody steps up to the place to help them, unless they learn the law themselves or teach themselves. They're going to do their time there. And of course, most people think DNA is the magic bullet now, but there's not DNA in most cases. Why don't they test Joe's DNA? Because the Commonwealth of Virginia lost all the biological evidence in the case or yeah. destroyed it. Under. Well, we have to, we have a two day trial hearing on that. Um, they said, yes, we deserved it. Yes, we, we should have it. Uh, sorry, we just can't find it. We've lost it. And the judge said, well, okay, well, I can't make them preserve and test what they, what they can't find. If you ever find it, feel free to come back. Still waiting. So Sabrina and Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. Joe, thank you. And for the people, we have real people in class, unlike your earlier session. <laughs> Can you please give them a round of applause? <laughs>